I want to say a few words about the origins of this essay. It started in a conference in Vienna in May, where uh, I met Martin schulz wessel I think for the first time, uh, maybe I only remember for the first time. It was a conference called uh, Bewältigte Vergangenheit, Neue Nationale und Internationale Historiographie zur Untergang der Habsburger Monarchie, which was strange because it's 1914 when we're talking about 100 years ago, not 1918, but, and I was assigned a topic, which I am not used to having organizers assign me a topic for a talk, which was Die Ukraine als erstes Opfer der Neuordnung. And I knew at once I didn't like this title, and I was going to fight with it, but I, I thought for a while, why? So I, I said that this, this appears to fall into a certain understanding of Ukrainian history as, a, as that of a state that appeared on the map of Europe as one of the first claimants to the right of national self-determination, a right that was proclaimed by Woodrow Wilson, by Vladimir Lenin, among others, um, and that this Ukraine, according to this title that I was suggested to think about, was the first victim of, of Woodrow Wilson and Lenin's new order, uh, and that this focus on the failure of the Ukrainian state seemed to me to reinforce a rather Maybe, I think unwittingly, I don't blame the organizers in Vienna for, for wanting to do this, but, I, but, but for me it reaffirmed the his, imperial historical narratives of Ukraine's neighbors, above all historically Russia and Poland, that saw Ukraine as a land of chaos, anarchy, not deserving independent statehood, but rather needing a more powerful empire or some other form of patron state to bring order and stability to this troubled region. And again, this is primarily the, the, the legacy of Russian and Polish historiography about Ukraine, but German historiography and, by extension, Anglo-American historiography took up this sort of imperial view that sees Ukraine as a non-historical nation and therefore not deserving of much attention. The founding myth of this sort of narrative of Ukraine is from the chronicle of bygone years, uh, when the Varangians were summoned to rule over Kiev and Rus because the Slavs had no unity, among themselves, and oddly enough, when the Germans came in 1918 to Ukraine, they said that they were coming, they were called by the Ukrainians to create order in the land, sort of mimicking the Varangians of, of the Chronicle of Kiev. So to challenge these imperial narratives that seem implicit in the original title, I wanted to uh, revisit some of the historiography, uh, given the aim of the conference, and talk about how uh, to look back at the end of the Great War and the origins of the Ukrainian state. And I turned to the origins of the first modern Ukrainian state in December 1917 and January 1918 and trace its appearance to a persistent struggle of networks of both Ukrainian nationalists and there would be an occasional allies in the diplomatic, military and political elites of the belligerent powers that culminated in a series of diplomatic recognitions of the Ukrainian National Republic between the end of 1917 and the first weeks of 1918, and then in the peace treaty between the Ukrainian National Republic and the Central Powers in February, on February 9th, 1918. Why, I, I have called in my article for the Tomorrow's Süddeutsche Zeitung is called The, for, the, for, the Vergessene Frieden, uh, and, I, and, and I want to talk about it because uh, the pioneering British historian of this period um, called the brest Treaty the Forgotten Peace, but his own book only focuses, or focuses almost entirely on the treaties, that sent, the treaties that central powers signed with Bolshevik Russia and leaves out the treaty with Ukraine. About this treaty, he says, has this to say, such was the peace with Ukraine that the Brotfrieden for which Chernin, the foreign minister of Austria-Hungary, labored for so long. The effect of it was to leave Ukraine theoretically a neutral state in the world while actually it became a political granary and storehouse for the central powers. This treaty, by the way, was used by the Allies, the, the Brest Treaty, to, uh, as an example of Germany's maximalist demands and for the, their own harsh treatment of the defeated powers at Versailles. Later, the Brest uh, peace and the occupation of Ukraine were seen as proof by Fritz Fischer as Germany's Griff nach Weltmacht, and he dated that Griff nach der Weltmacht, as many of you know, to July 1914 memorandum of Chancellor Bettmann Hulwig. Uh, Fischer's chapter on the Peace of Brest-Litovsk has the title of the first realization of German war aims. So for Fischer, 
The occupation of Ukraine was the realization of the July 14th memorandum of Edmund Holtvig, and, and it was tied to questions of German war guilt. Um, he too specifically uh, mostly refers to the treaty with Soviet Russia that was signed on March 3rd. When he does talk about uh, the treaty with Ukraine, he says that for Austria-Hungary it was fair to treat it as the bread beast, the Brotfrieden, but that Germany had a different perspective and beyond immediate economic wishes, it had to do with the fulfillment of German aims and plans since fall 1914. So again, he harps on this. The occupation of Ukraine was the typical example of Germany's Griff nach der Erdmacht. In sharp contrast to all of these judgments is that of uh, Pavlo Kristiuk, a Ukrainian uh, member of the Ukrainian government in 1917, an important historian of the Ukrainian revolution, also a Ukrainian socialist revolutionary who had no love for German or Austrian militarism. He judged the treaty as perhaps the only non-imperialist treaty in form of all the numerous treaties concluded after it at the end of the great universal imperial war under the dictates of the bourgeois entente. It was concluded without annexations and indemnities. Austrian Foreign Minister Ottokar Chernin noted in his memoirs the great hopes that the great powers placed in the new state of the Ukrainian National Republic and saw it as a strong new factor in international politics and in harmony with them. Khrushchev goes on to note that the fact that in the further course of historical events, the Brest Treaty between Ukraine and the Central Powers was not exploited, that the wheel of history rolled over it and crushed it does not diminish its significance in the history of the national liberation struggle and state-building activity of the Ukrainian people. Two other historians, uh, both Ukrainian diaspora historians, uh, Oleg Fedishin and Oleg Pithaini, share this more positive view of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with Ukraine. And I, I won't read you their, um, their testaments to this order, but they basically take up Christuk's argument and expand it, that the, treat, the peace treaty not only was the first peace treaty signed in the entire war, again, even though it was annulled later on, and it was a treaty signed with a state of Ukraine that hadn't existed before that treaty was signed. In the spirit of this somewhat perhaps revisionist reading of the treaty with Ukraine, I'd like to redirect this discussion away from victimhood, which has had a far too prominent place in Ukrainian history and memory, and to recast the narrative of my talk around lost alternatives and opportunities. And if you read the memoirs of this period, and, and it's amazing how many contemporaries who were at Brest Litovsk wrote their memoirs, Trotsky, General Hoffmann, Otto Karchernin, Richard von Kuhlmann, the German State Secretary, uh, several of the Ukrainian participants, Trotsky uh, above all, all of them wrote their memoirs and some of them were reading each other's memoirs as they were writing their memoirs and each of them devoted long chapters to the Treaty of Brest Litovsk. The, 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 the memoir of General Max Hoffmann, who was one of the top two German negotiators at the Brest Talks, was called Der Krieg der Versäumten Gelegenheit. And this sort of sums up my view of, of many of the players in this, uh, that they saw what they created in, 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 Aust in, in Ukraine and with the treaty as a lost, a squandered opportunity. Um, and this is an opinion that comes close to that of Austrian historian Wolf Dieter Biel, who also agrees that the treaty with, with Ukraine was the first step to a general peace that was of far greater significance for Austria-Hungary than the treaty with Russia. It was the first, the end, the first attempt to end the bloodletting and as such it is to be positively judged from the perspective of humanity. The Ukrainian people achieved recognition of the state independence it had regained after losing it with the Pyrrhyaslav Agreement of 1654. This is the leading Austrian historian of the Treaty of brest agrees with Christuk and Fedishin and me, uh, most importantly. So let me, let's see how do I make this move? Let me make it move this way. No. Okay. Next, build up, build down. Build. There we go. Oops. Wrong one. Okay. 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 This, um, this man in the left up here is Pablo Christou, who's sort of one of my heroes because he's one who forced me to rethink all of these issues and then go back and reread everybody else's memoirs and come up with this paper for you today. Similarly, the German, Austrian, Hungarian occupation of Ukraine, uh, to which Fischer re re uh, refers and to which all the other authors refer, has, has been interpreted above all by Fischer as part of the war aims of the Germans from the start. But until, and until recently, uh, scholars have devoted very little attention to that occupation. Um, but the leading British historian of the Civil War in Russia agrees that the most important occupation of the war was 
the German-Austrian occupation of Ukraine, and not the more familiar one, to, at least to English language audiences, which was the, the whites uh, and, and the, the sort of British and French and Japanese occupations in Siberia and elsewhere. More broadly, uh, the Eastern Front is still widely perceived as the Vergessene Front. So there's a lot of Vergessene, Frieden, Vergessene Front, and, and Versäumte Gelegenheiten here that I want to try to unpack and maybe present a more positive view. The story starts uh, uh, with before the outbreak of the war and with different possibilities for an independent Ukrainian state in Austro-Hungary and Russia. And then in 1917, with the formation of the Ukrainian Central Rada in spring of 1917, uh, we have uh, the, the beginnings of the Ukrainian national movement in Kiev. Um, the story might end with the post-war negotiations that are commonly known as Versailles, and which a lot of recent literature highlights as a failed Wilsonian moment, in re reference to the title that I was assigned, uh, for the colonial world, but I think uh, Christuk also would say that the Wilson and the Versailles uh, negotiations was a failed moment for Ukraine and, and for the peoples in between uh, Germany and, and, and Russia as well. Um, the history of the German-Austrian occupation, in turn, illustrates the challenges, and, and I started writing about occupation, by the way, as an American living in New York City on 9-11, on my sabbatical at Columbia University, and I was frightened sometimes at how many parallels there were to the way our occupations in Afghanistan and Iraq were turning out and the way the German occupation was turning out in Ukraine in 1918. So I get confused sometimes between which era and which occupation I'm talking about. It's, but but I, I want to say that the Germans in their eight months in Ukraine, I think, illustrated all the dilemmas that succeeding occupations, including the American occupation in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, will have for any, any, any uh, power that wants to try to create set up a state and then try to treat it as if it were a real state uh, with real relations uh, uh, in, in, as a sovereign state. I turn also to uh, a recent book that I'm sure many of you have heard of by now since it's been a bestseller in German since it came out, which is Die Schlaftwandler from uh, Christopher Clark, who, uh, as you heard from my introduction, uh, was uh, sees World War I as a modern event, the most complex of modern times. And he traces the history of the origins of, of the war, I think in some 500 pages or 600 pages, going back over the literature of how the war started. He's not interested in why it started, which is to say he's not interested in who is to blame for its start, as many of you know. That's what got him into a lot of trouble with Serbians and Germans and others. But he's interested in how the war started. And that's what I'm sort of interested in, how the peace came to be in, in, at the end of the war. And I think I can use his approach of, of why people came to peace out of all sorts of different agendas and, and help to overturn some more of the Fisher legacy that, um, that we still seem to be living with. Um, he, he makes uh, a lot of interesting points that oftentimes policy uh, during the outbreak of the war, or up, leading up to the outbreak of the war, was not just made by uh, people at the apex of the top of the system. Often policies would emanate from quite peripheral locations, the diplomatic apparatus, from military commanders, from ministerial officials, from ambassadors who were often policy makers in their own right. And the story I'm going to tell you about the making of the peace and the making of Ukraine is a very similar story. Multiple centers of decision making, above all Kiev and brest but also Vienna, Berlin, sometimes Lviv, uh, acting together to create this peace and out of the peace, a Ukrainian state and out of the Ukrainian state, an occupation regime that keeps that state going despite all odds for another eight months. Another insight that um, Clark brings to his understanding of the decision making is that when you look for who is to blame, it tends to disposed the investigator, in his words, to construe the actions of decision makers as planned and driven by coherent intention. It also um, focuses uh, one's attention on, on the nation state and what he wants to do is, is, is open up to sort of emphasize the multilateral process of interaction between states and nations that he thinks is important to understanding both the outbreak of war and I think is an understanding to understand the outbreak of peace such as it was. So I'm going to try to apply Clark's understanding of the outbreak of war to the outbreak of peace and, and, and hope this makes some sense. So the Rada, uh, the evolution of the Central Rada into the Ukrainian National Republic uh, is part of the story and um, the 
Okay, here's the eastern front, which I don't need to show it to this audience. Okay, why is it going the wrong direction now? Okay, go that way. No, 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 no. Why is it going this way? Okay. Can go this way. Okay, there we go. Okay, that's the right direction. Okay. Okay. So I so said we have several perspectives on, on this, uh, this piece, these few weeks in, in Je December, January, and February, and, and March, when the, these pieces are signed. Um, we have the memoirs in, of, of Ukrainians, Pavel Kristuk, Dmitro Doroshenko, Ivan Mazepa, Volodymyr Venichenko, and plenty more. We have, as I said, Trotsky, and Chernin, and Kuhlman, and, and Richard Hoffman. Um, and that's how I'm going to try to reconstruct the story with, with their help. All of these historians agree that by uh, the late uh, months of 1917, the Ukrainian statehood after several uh, uh, universals were proclaimed in, in response to conflict between Petrograd and the provisional government in Petrograd and the Petrograd Soviet and the Ukrainian Republic, that um, the next stage was for the Ukrainian Republic to um, get recognition internationally. And all the, 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 uh, that happened uh, already before uh, the declaration of, 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 the, of the Bolsheviks declaring peace, um, the, the first uh, country to actually recognize Ukraine was France. And the man who was responsible for that is this other member of the Rada, also a, a very young man, is because all of these men we're going to talk about are under 30, they're under age 30. They all come from the Ukrainian national movement, either through the soldiers' Ukrainian movement or through the student movement. So they're all relatively young, and especially when you see the pictures um, of the, of the, of the, I should, where's it going again? Okay. Of the, of the people on the other side, this is General Hoffman, Richard Kuhlman, uh, uh, Talat uh, Pasha, no, I mean, Pan Chernin, Talat Pasha, and Kuhlman. These are all men in their 60s and 70s, serious men with serious uniforms and serious medals, compared to the Ukrainian delegation, all under 30. Um, Okay, where am I? So the, the French were the first to recognize Ukraine and they helped to influence the British. Why were there French in Ukraine? Why were there British? Remember that in World War I, Russia was allied with France, Britain, and eventually the United States. All of these powers together with Italy, Serbia, eventually Romania, had military liaisons in, in Russia. All of them had military liaisons in the southwestern front of the Russian army, which was headquartered in Kiev. So all of these military liaisons had some knowledge of the Ukrainian movement starting in February and March 1917. Some of them, like General Philippe uh, Georges Tabouille of the French, who was the French military liaison, sort of became pro-Ukrainian, became a Ukrainophile, and kept urging his government to recognize this, this government in Ukraine. He persuaded the British, who, who sort of left Ukrainian affairs to the French in 1917, and the Americans, who came into the war much later, um, didn't get so far as recognizing the Ukrainians, but sent their consulate from uh, Latvia to Kiev to set up a consulate there in anticipation of future recognition. It never happened because events interceded and all of the Entente powers had to leave uh, Kiev. But, but the first, and it was very important for the, for the Rada, the Central Rada, that France was the first country to recognize them because they were all socialists, uh, socialist revolutionaries and social democrats. For these socialists, France was the home of the French Revolution, which was in some sense their predecessor, their, their mother revolution. Like the Russian Bolsheviks and the Russian socialists as well, they all looked to France as kind of their model. So that the French would be the first republic to recognize the Ukrainian Republic was a great diplomatic uh, coup. And it was that this man, Shulhin, this very young man, I think he was 25 years old when he accepted France's recognition of Ukraine as the International Secretary of, uh, of, of the uh, General Secretariat. The, um, it was, but there was more complicated thing, and, and I've been trying to argue in other articles that the history of the Eastern Front needs to be taught as a, as, and understood as an entangled history. Uh, and I've uh, borrowed from Andreas Papeler and, and Philippe Ter uh, their notion of verflochtene Geschichte, to, which they usually talk about in, in peacetime, and I'm talking about in wartime, that the connections between the empires and between the national movements and among the national movements cannot be done, cannot be uh, uh, properly appreciated if you take them as one country 
separated from the others. They have to be understood in this dynamic. In that regard, one of the other important actors in Kiev at this time was the Czechoslovak Legion. Why were there Czechoslovak legions in Kiev and around Kiev? Because they were prisoners of war from the Austro-Hungarian Empire who ended up in the Kiev area and who, thanks to the nation-building founding nation -building efforts of Tomas Masaryk, who happened to spend most of 1917 in Kiev, negotiating over the fate of the Czechoslovak Legion, which was supposed to leave Russia through Siberia, come back around the ocean to France and fight with France against Austria-Hungary for the liberation of Czechoslovak, Czechoslovak lands from Austro-Hungary. So we had the Czechoslovak Legion in Kiev, the subject of negotiations between authorities in Petrograd, between the Central Rada authorities, eventually with Bolshevik authorities after the provisional government is thrown away, and Tomas Masaryk spends a good part of 1917 in Kiev negotiating on behalf of these soldiers. So another piece of this, there are also 24,000 Serbian soldiers in Kiev who could be used for military uses, but they all have to leave once the Rada delegation goes to brest to start negotiating with central powers. How does this happen? The Bolsheviks, uh, in one of their first acts after they take power in Petrograd, call for peace negotiations. It was one of the promises of the Bolsheviks coming to power. The central powers responded to the peace call. Uh, the, 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 other, the Entente powers did not respond to the peace call, as you know. And, and they asked the participants to come, the Bolsheviks to come, to send a delegation to brest which is the headquarters of the Eastern Front. By the way, the Eastern Front at that time was commanded by Prince Leopold of Bayern. So even Bavaria has a very important place to play in the creation of this first modern state. At the brest negotiations, not only was Prince Leopold von Bayern there, but the Staatssekretär, the Bayerische Staatssekretär, was also in brest negotiating on behalf of some part of Germany uh, with Ukraine. So we have, uh, in response to um, the Bolshevik call for peace and in response to their own fourth universal, the, the Ukrainians also issue their own appeal for peace and, and show up in brest They No one invited them, um, they just sort of showed up and to the surprise of the central power, to the surprise of the Bolsheviks, and they insist that um, they want to negotiate. Here's, um, now say a few words, let me show you the first the Ukrainian delegation. This is the, the main actors of the Ukrainian delegation, and look how young they are again compared to the generals around them who are the Germans. They're all, they, they made a very good impression on all of the central power who wrote about them. Chernin wrote about them, uh, Hoffman wrote about them, Kuhlman wrote about them, even Trotsky wrote about them with a lot of contempt, but he, he wrote about, he, he had shared that con contempt for everyone of the negotiations, including Chernin and Hoffman. But they, um, these ones appeared uh, to meet with the, the Germans, Hungarian, Austro-Hungarians, Turks, and Bulgarians. And the first Soviet delegation was sent, and again, remember, the Soviets were the ones who called for, the Bolsheviks were the ones who called for the peace talks. They sent a worker, a sailor, and a woman terrorist, assassin, who had blown up some Tsarist official and served time for it, as their delegation to the Germans. The Germans, as you can imagine, uh, found this a bit of an affront, sent them home and saying, if you're not going to be serious, we don't want to talk to you. The Ukrainians come looking like this, being, and they've all, all been in power for about six months, so they actually have more experience than the Bolsheviks who have just been in power for a few weeks. They make a much better impression on the, on the central powers who didn't expect them to show up in any case, and so they say, well, we've got someone we can negotiate with. The Bolsheviks are going to be un ridiculous and unreasonable. We'll negotiate with the Ukrainians. And they do. So, um, the, uh, I think it's important to focus on these guys because they, I mean, one of the other stereotypes of, about Ukraine is that their leadership and their elites can never come to any agreement on any in fundamental issues. These guys impressed all the central power negotiators and how united they were against a united front they presented against both the central power negotiators and against Bolshevik Russia. They, they stuck to their guns, they pushed, and, and all of the negotiators agreed that the Ukrainians got pretty much everything they wanted out of, of the, the big guys. How did this happen? No one who came to the negotiating table came there out of their free will uh, because they wanted to be there. 
Every one of those people who came to the negotiating table came out of desperate weakness. So let's start with the Ukrainians. They were afraid that the Bolsheviks were about to attack any, any day, and the Bolsheviks did attack, as they predicted. Their state was, again, on the verge of collapse if the Bolsheviks attacked. The Bolsheviks had just seized power a month and a half before they made the call that they came to Brest-Litovsk. Um, they faced famine, they faced economic ruin, they faced the beginnings of counter-revolution among the Don Cossacks and elsewhere around Russia. They wanted peace so they could build socialism and spread the revolution. The Austrians, Vienna was starving, on the verge of starvation. There were political strikes um, throughout January of 1918. Chernin was getting reports from Vienna of how fragile the situation. He wrote at some point to the Kaiser Wilhelm that Austria had only a couple months left to live if some peace didn't happen. Even the Germans were under a lot of pressure because uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff were back in Berlin and they wanted a final offensive to end the war and they needed that offensive to be on the Western Front so they needed the Eastern Front to be shut down to transfer troops from the East to the West. On top of that, this was a very kind of unusual moment in diplomacy, international diplomacy. In the Reichstag and in the Reichsrat in Vienna, there were social democratic majorities who were demanding a just peace without requisitions, without indemnities, without annexations, not a Sieg victory, not a sort of Hindenburg victory, but a, a peace, a, a, a democratic peace. Trotsky and, and Wilson both, I mean, strangely enough, for a very brief moment, both advocated a transparent, open diplomacy, and the end to secret diplomacy. Trotsky, as you may know, um, published a lot of the secret Tsarist treaties uh, in 1917 and 1918 in, in this kind of gesture of opening up diplomacy. Woodrow Wilson, in his 14 points, also called for open diplomacy. Again, didn't last long in either case, but Edward Snowden, by the way, has been citing Trotsky and Wilson uh, for his disclosures with all of his, you know, things that he disclosed from the NSA. So. People still read about these things. So that was another piece. The other thing was Trotsky, um, who showed up also later here. There he is. Trotsky shows up on the second delegation after the sailor, terrorist, assassin, and, and soldier and workers are sent home. And uh, Trotsky comes with Mikhail Pakrovsky. Many of you may know him as a Marxist historian who um, eventually falls falls victim to Stalin's uh, change in tone of, of history. And then the um, other man in the middle there is uh, uh, Sergei Yof, Aldov Yofe, who worked with Trotsky in Vienna when they were both correspondents for Kievsky and Wiesel, uh, uh, the leading Kiev newspaper in, in, in Ukraine. Um, they were correspondents in Vienna and together. So they come to Brest because they know German, they know Austrian culture, they think they can pull one over on the, on the Austrian negotiators. And, and, and Trotsky pretty much makes known from the beginning he wants to use the peace negotiations as a propaganda tribune to spread the revolution to Europe. He does get from the Germans, who surprisingly agreed to this, that there will be publicity for all the negotiations. So every day there should be a summary of the conversations that were held by all sides. There's a, an editorial commission that agrees to a kind of version that can be sent to the press. And every day there's a report of what is talked about at these negotiations. So Trotsky actually gets something out of the Germans uh, who are under pressure from their own Reichstag deputies and Reichsrat, Reichsrat deputies to get a good peace out of here. Plus, I mean, there's the desperation of starving cities, which, which again, Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. Ukraine has grain, so Ukraine is useful to all these people. I mean, none of them even knew about Ukraine much before they got there. But all of a sudden, Ukraine is a very useful diplomatic player, and the Ukrainian diplomats play this to the hilt. They, they understand the weaknesses of all of them. They understand that they're weak too. Uh, Trotsky understands that he's weak, but they're all playing with the weaknesses of the others and the divisions among the others. Uh, okay, where am I? So here's the, all of them at the table. Remarkable pictures I found on Wikipedia of all places. Uh, and, and out of this, the... Um, a couple, there are a few, few things that I want to make a point. Not only um, are these young Ukrainian diplomats very successful at pushing their line, which includes what they get out of Chernin is very interesting because Chernin, um, well, there are different players. I, I was, let, me, let, me, let me make this more sensible here. 
I, I'd say this man, after the Ukrainians, General Max Hoffmann, is probably the most important player in the creation of the Ukrainian state and in these negotiations. He is the, probably the best informed Russia expert in the German high command. He had a lot of experience in pre-war Russia. He knew Ukraine from a business perspective. He did business in Ukraine before the war. He knew Russian pretty fluently. And he kind of took the cause of the young Ukrainians to heart, uh, especially when it became clear that Chernin, because he was Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, even though he was Czech, he had a certain Polish problem to worry about whenever, he, whenever Ukrainians came up. The, the Poles wanted to send a delegation, by the way, to Brest Tus because they thought something was going to be traded away that they were concerned about to the Ukrainians, but, but the Germans decided that they wouldn't allow that. So Chernin was aware that if he made any concessions to the Ukrainians at these negotiations, he was going to have hell to pay for it back in Vienna with the Poles. And sure enough, uh, but he, he was persuaded by the Ukrainian delegation to both agree to transfer the homeland to Ukraine and to set up after the war a separate crown land for Bukovina and Galicia without asking the Poles. And of course, when there's, a, there's supposed to be secret. This is one of the first casualties of the, of the treaty was that open negotiations were one of the first casualties. They were, all of them had things to hide. The Austrians hid. Uh, at least as best they could, that they were making these concessions to the Ukrainians. The word got out. The Poles started having demonstrations once they heard that, that the Austrians had already done this. The Ukrainians, by the way, could not really tell their own people that they had just agreed to deliver a million poods of grain to Austria and Germany. So they left that secret too. So a lot of things fell out of this treaty very, very quickly. But another important thing here besides Hoffmann, Hoffmann realized that Chernin was very uncomfortable with the Ukrainians. And they were very uncomfortable with him. So he offered, he volunteered to take the Ukrainian cause to himself. And he sort of negotiated with the Ukrainians, told them when they went too far, told them when they could go farther, and basically helped them negotiate their position. So Max Hoffmann, I think, is one of the authors of the Ukrainian state, probably a revisionist thought here in Germany, but uh, maybe in Ukraine too, even more so. Um, okay, that, that we don't want to show him yet. Uh, the other thing that is um, uh, interesting about this, this set of treaty, treaty negotiations is that we start seeing Ukrainian actors who have been busy in Berlin and Vienna all of a sudden come to play a very important role here too. The leading uh, deputy to the Reichsrat from Bukovina is a Graf Nikola Vasilko, who is supposedly a good friend of Chernin, the, uh, uh, the foreign minister. Vasilko comes to Brest-Litovsk and tells the Ukrainians, the, the, the Rada Ukrainian delegation, about how bad the famine is in, in Vienna. And that gives the, the Ukrainians some sense that they can push harder on Chernin, which they do. And Chernin at one point says, you know, I, I think these Ukrainians are, are good guys, but at one point they stopped ne negotiating with me, they started dictating to me. That was the foreign minister of Austria was saying he was being dictated to by the, the Ukrainian, and, and he gave in to the dictator because he ha had no choice. Another figure is Mykola Zaleznyak, uh, a Ukrainian social revolutionary who had been one of the founders of the Union for Liberation of Ukraine back in 1914, who had been living in Berlin uh, all this time, sort of keeping context with German officials about Ukraine. And he came to brest too to join Vasilko. So we have this combination of Berlin, Vienna, Ukrainians coming to meet in brest with Kiev Ukrainians to help create the state. And again, there was not that much contact among them that I, I know of. I, I have a feeling there was more than we know about, but they, they seemed to be able to come to agreement on all the basic issues that they uh, wanted to present to the central powers, and they presented this united front, which won, which won them their recognition of their state. Another thing that this, these negotiations um, give lie to, another sort of stereotype, is that Ukraine is always the most disorganized, unstable, chaotic, anarchic uh, place to be. And Russia is sort of, on the contrary, a stable, orderly, if not dictatorial state. At this particular moment in history, Ukraine actually looked relatively much better and much more peaceful and stable to all the negotiating parties, the Germans, the Austria, Hungarians, than did Russia. I mean, Bolshevik Russia, all the reports coming in from Bolshevik Russia were horrible. There was terrorism, there was famine, there was ruin. Whereas Ukraine, at this moment at least, until the end of 1917, 
looked relatively stable and was relatively stable compared. So again, and this made a difference to the negotiators in central, uh, the central powers because they wanted to have a, an agreement with some kind of a state that, that was going to be around for a while, which maybe was a wrong bet at any rate. But that was, again, this kind of conf conflates or, or at least contradicts the normal sort of stereotype that we have that Russia is sort of the land of order and Ukraine is the land of chaos because in this case it was not that way. Russia was in much better, much worse shape than, than was Ukraine. Now, in the meantime, uh, there were also forces that were hostile to the Ukrainian state and to Ukrainian independence in particular, and that was one that's maybe not so unfamiliar today, that's Bolshevik Russia. And while Trotsky and Lenin uh, recognized the Ukrainian Republic, they recognized it in, in, a, in a way that would become sort of typical of Bolshevik pronouncements. There was a manifesto. Let me just see if I can find the, the title of this manifesto so you get the full uh, effect of it. Um, the manifesto, uh, Manifest Soviet Narodnych, Soviet Narodnych Komisarov k Ukrainskemu Narodu s ultimativnymi trebovanimi k Ukrainske Radie. So it was kind of a double-pronged manifesto, first to the Ukrainian people, recognizing their right of self-determination, their right of, of even a secession from Russia. On the other hand, it was a note with an ultimatum to the Ukrainian Rada, the official government, which this very manifesto sort of made it implicit or explicit that the Bolsheviks considered the Rada to be illegitimate as a state, because the Narod was addressed separately from the state. And the, the ultimatum amounted to a, an accusation that the Rada was helping the enemies of the counter-revolution, the bourgeois counter-revolution, and that if in 48 hours the Rada did not answer this ultimatum, it would be considered to be in a state of war. So the very first war of the peace, even before the peace was signed, was the Bolshevik attack on Ukraine in December 1917, two days after this ultimatum was delivered. Uh, the results of that war was uh, a bombing, a sacking. Uh, actually, the first, the first attack was a failure because the soldiers, the Red Army soldiers, were told that they were going to fight against the Don Cossack country revolutionary down south. And when they found out they were going to Ukraine, most of them fled and, and turned back, didn't want to go fight Ukraine. So Lenin sent out a new order, and um, the man who's sort of the, the Soviet... Um, father of the father of the Soviet Ukrainian nation is another Ukrainian. By the way, Trotsky was born, I don't know how many of you know, in, U in what is today Ukraine, in a town called Yanivka, that's about 30 kilometers outside of Kharkiv. So, strange product of Ukraine, kind of the unmaker of Ukrainian independence. But, and this is, an, this is his sort of handyman, the Viceroy for Soviet Ukraine. This is uh, sometimes known as Volodymyr, but usually known as Vladimir Anton Vasienko, born in Chernihiv to a Russian military family, but a Ukrainian mother. And he becomes sort of the, the, the Soviet general governor of, of Soviet Ukraine. He orders the sacking of Kiev with a, a man named Muravyov, whose picture I can't find, unfortunately, um, who bombs Kiev for about 10 days and then unleashes a terror attack on, on, on Kiev. Um, and I'll read you a little bit about what he calls for. He says, um, order number nine issued on February 4th. He called on his troops to exterminate without mercy in Kiev all officers and students of military academies, Haidamaks, monarchists, and all enemies of the revolution. The number of persons who were killed was estimated to be about 3,000. The total number of victims and prisoners was over 10,000, especially uh, Russian officers and priests were killed, but also anyone who looked or spoke Ukrainian was executed. Um, this same Muravyov said, we are going to bring the revolution to Ukraine on the, on the tips of our bayonets. Not with ideas, not with elections, not with referendums, but on the tips of our bayonets. And, and this was taken by most Ukrainian national activists as the beginning of a very sad chapter in the history of both revolutions. Um, not surprisingly, this terror occupation uh, by Muravyo poisoned relations between the two revolutionary governments. Um, and as, as the father of Ukrainian history of the Ukrainian nation, Mikhail Shushevsky, said, the, these are in the main the setting of the new catastrophe through which our Ukraine had to pass 
Not only are men being killed in it, but ideas as well. Not only cities are being destroyed, but traditions too. They burn historical, cultural, economic, and all other ties of the Ukrainian people with the Russian people. And again, Christuk said this was probably the greatest tragedy of both revolutions that they went to war with each other. That it was the first war between genuine democracies in the world in the 20th century, indeed between a people, workers and peasants, and another people. He lamented that the centralist occupation conduct of the Bolsheviks in Ukraine did more to discredit the slogans of socialist revolution and Soviet power than all any enemies of the toiling people's liberation. He also saw this war, this Russian-Ukrainian war, again, kind of a, a forgotten war, too. I mean, here we have this peace being negotiated while the Bolsheviks are waging their first war as a, a state against, uh, against another state that calls itself socialist and, and also federalist in, in its ambitions. Uh, Christuk saw this war leading to a general sharpening of the national struggle in Ukraine to the growth of nationalism, both Ukrainian and Russian, but also Jewish nationalism. Finally, it marked a shattering, a shattering of the forces of Ukrainian revolutionary democracy, their turn to the right, and the growth of nationalist sentiment. But he said even Christuk, who always seems to have this, this indomitable optimistic spirit, that there was no misfortune without its good side. This war placed the problem of Ukraine's national political rebirth on the international agenda. The Russian Bolshevik, like the reactionary imperialist bourgeoisie, this is all Christuk's words, was accustomed to view Ukraine as an eternal colony of Russia and the Ukrainian people as passive, unconscious, uncultured as the Ukrainian ethnographic mass. But now, um, having broken the bayonets of his rifles in Ukraine, albeit on German helmets, was forced to change his views of the Ukrainian national rebirth. And all of these, these commentators, whether it's Hristiuk or Fedishin or others, believe that it was because of this, the, the, the sort of intensity of the resistance of the Ukrainians in this war, and subsequently uh, after that, that the Bolsheviks uh, ended up agreeing to a Soviet Socialist Republic in 1921 and 1922, and that they kept a, Soviet, a, a Ukrainian content to, to whatever they made into the Soviet Union, and even kept institutions that dated from this period, the Rekhom Narada, the Academy of Sciences, institutions that survived the worst, uh, worst excesses of Stalinism into 1991, when they became, to some degree, the, the building blocks of a new independent state in 1991. So that, um, again, I want to make a point that this, this, this peace treaty and this recognition of Ukraine came about not out of anybody's long-term or short-term plans. Maybe the Ukrainians had long-term plans. They were the only ones who had long-term plans about Ukraine. But the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians came to brest kind of open, open to any, any possibilities. The Bolsheviks had their own agendas, but they, again, were desperately weak and needed a peace, so they eventually gave in to a peace after. And again, the reason the actual timing of the peace with Ukraine had to do with the Bolsheviks again. And in some sense, Trotsky, in spite of himself, and certainly not because he wished a, a, a prosperous, independent Ukraine, because he was so outrageous in his behavior and his demands, he made the Ukrainians a kind of reasonable-looking alternative. So, I mean, I, those of you may know that Trotsky finally exasperated the Germans with the, uh, his formula of no war, no peace, and he went home, signing, refusing to sign the peace but also refusing to, to end the war. And then the Germans decided to launch their attack, and then finally Trotsky got, well, Lenin persuaded Trotsky to finally sign the treaty, and the Germans and the Russians signed the treaty, but by that time, the, the Germans had already begun a war against the Bolsheviks. Okay, so that kind of tells you how we get a Ukrainian state, oops, and how we get uh, uh, the peace. But I, I don't want to spend too much time on, on the next part, but because I've written more about that. The next part is about the occupation, and here we come closer to more contemporary. Um, again, even at the beginning of the occupation, uh, the Germans and the Austrians tried to observe sort of diplomatic protocol. They brought the routed government back to Kiev after the Bolsheviks had kicked them out for a while. They reinstalled this, this Ukrainian government with which they made the treaty. This Ukrainian government, and, and, they, and they also sent an ambassador, and, and the ambassador who went to Ukraine was this fellow, Ambassador Philip Alfons Mumpf von Schwarzenstein. So you can see he's an Adler, so it's not just a, an ordinary ambassador, it's a, a big ambassador. And the ambassador, by the way, that the military, the high command, the German high command, opposed. They wanted to send a lower level 
person, but the foreign ministry under um, von Kuhlmann wanted to send a high-level ambassador, and they sent this one. The Austrians sent, likewise, a very high-level uh, ambassador to Kiev. So there was real diplomatic relationship with Kiev and, and, and Vienna and Berlin. And I say Gruner uh, is another one of these uh, people who spends a lot of time in Ukraine and kind of becomes a Ukrainophile. Um, again, I, I think the, the occupation was doomed to go bad because of the conditions. I mean, Ukraine was not in very good shape after the Bolshevik occupation, even for, for a couple of weeks. Um, the, the grain obligations were very heavy, uh, and the way that the grain was collected by, by the German officials eventually, and the Austrian officials, led to outbursts of, of, of uprisings at Postania and and as Gruner predicted, by the way, Gruner knew what he was doing. He was a specialist in logistics and, and railroads and all that sort of thing. He said to the high command when he was appointed to this job as commander of the occupation in Ukraine, this army you gave me is too small. In two months, I guarantee you're going to have an outburst of insurgency. He was right. In less than two months, Kiev was such an insurgent site that the, the commander-in-chief of, of the occupation, who I also have a picture of here, Oops, I don't have a picture of him. Um, General Eichhorn was assassinated by terrorists, and most German and Austrian troops were afraid to go anywhere outside of Kiev, the green zone of, of this period, 1918, because the peasants and, who were revolting against the green uh, uh, requisitions and all the Ukrainian parties who, who were against Etman Skoropatsky. So the Germans ended up having to do a regime change, which we've heard from more recent history, and, and supporting someone who was a dictator, uh, a dictator with monarchical pretensions, this Skoropatsky. But even Skoropatsky and the Germans sort of play this game, and Gruner develops a kind of personal relationship with, with Skoropatsky. Skoropatsky's biggest dream is to create his own national army, because he rightly feels, as a general, that he can't do much to, to defend Ukraine against future enemies if he doesn't have his own army. And the Germans keep putting him off, saying, you know, we've got our own army here. That's enough to sort of maintain order until we go. After we go, you can build your army, which is not a very good advice. But he does persuade Gruner, who persuades the ambassador, to get an audience with Kaiser Wilhelm. So Skoropatsky, when Skoropatsky, sort of the height of Skoropatsky's diplomatic success is his visit to Berlin, where he is received by Kaiser Wilhelm and Hindenburg and Ludendorff. Kaiser Wilhelm gives him some sort of origin, makes him, uh, I don't know what, sort of like what we gave Klitschko yesterday at the university, um, and, and sends him home with a promise that he can start building his army. So again, and then the ultimate irony, maybe I'll end with this sort of story of entanglements. When, when the Bolsheviks, when, when Hoskoropatsky is overthrown by more peasant insurgency and, and more socialist up uprisings, he flees eventually to Berlin, where Gruner sets up for him in Wannsee, in Berlin, a Ukrainian institute that promotes his monarchical ideas. And he lives in Berlin throughout the entire interwar period until he leaves Berlin in 1945 as the Russian army, is, the Soviet army, is invading. He ends up in Munich where he is bombed by American and British planes and dies in Munich. So, I mean, again, the contributions of Germany to the creation of Ukraine and to the sustenance of Ukraine are remarkable. Um, but again, I want to end with this by saying the Ukrainians were, of course, the key actors. Without the Ukrainians showing up in Brussels, just none of this would ever happen. But without friendly people like Gruner and Hoffmann and Kuhlmann and even Chernin, in spite of all his hesitations, there would not have been a Ukrainian state. And, um, and I, you know, I come back to the present. This article I wrote for the Feuilleton uh, tomorrow that's appearing. You know, recently, President Obama, my, my president, for better or for worse, um, announced that Afghanistan is sort of on its own now, that Afghanistan kind of has to stand on its own feet. The world can't help it anymore. I said, really? I mean, after the British, the Russians, the Soviets, us, kind of mangled that country for so many years, we expect it to, you know, just to sort of come back. And then the same thing with Ukraine. I mean, I don't think Ukraine can survive without help uh, from its neighbors, friendly neighbors, hopefully, because it is still in a very hostile neighborhood as we know from recent news. So I, I, I think this is not such an unusual condition. We have a bunch of states dating from World War I that continue to be relatively unstable, but are not fake states, they're not artificial states. 
But they are joint projects of the international community and they have to be continuing joint projects of the international community if they're going to be sustained. So with that harangue, I will conclude. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.